All right, I think we're ready to go. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bernie O'Rourke and I'm the Extension Youth Livestock Specialist here at UW-Madison. And uh, we are so, we're so glad you were able to take your Friday afternoon to be with us to learn a little bit more about uh, pigs and, and swine. And so we wanted to um, start these uh, virtual farm opportunities uh, for young people of all ages and also uh, producers and any other uh, folks that want to learn, learn more about swine. So today we are going to um, tour the uh, Arlington Swine Research and Teaching Unit. And so there's a lot of us folks here within the Animal Science Department through UW-Madison that work in the swine unit. And so we've got a great group of people here today that are going to um, actually take us through this tour. Uh, it's a neat opportunity to see inside a uh, swine unit. And some folks I know maybe haven't had that opportunity before. So um, I'm gonna just get started with a couple of little uh, tidbits related to just the housekeeping and how to manage Zooms. Uh, many of you have probably been engaged with Zoom technology, um, but I just wanted to remind you that um, Today, I'm gonna to keep you guys all on mute. It helps with um, the hearing for everyone. And then also the speakers have a really good then clear voice for us to be able to record this for future use. Um, so if you do have a question, which we uh, really do encourage you to do that, is to use the chat box. And so you can see here on this screen, um, there is an arrow to the chat box. So if you wanna ask questions, um, please go ahead and do that. And then also you can see that um, you can mute yourself uh, down here um, and, and then I uh, will periodically mute you um, if, if you're not. Uh, so please stay muted um, and, and use the chat box for any questions that you have, okay? Um, so I am going to put here um, in the chat box, there's going to be a little survey we'd like you to fill out at the end. And so that just kind of helps us get a taste of who um, is on today, but then also it gives us the opportunity to kind of hear from you and then what other things that you would like to, to know about related to um, animals as we are um, in this uh, technology time. So um, you can see that link I put in the chat box. I don't know if you can actually click on it, but you can copy and paste it into um, another, uh, uh, open tab on your internet and so when the, when the tour is done today please go ahead and do that if you would please um, I think that's it for uh, in terms of housekeeping the only other thing um, we'd like you to do is um, if you could find um, Katie K-A-D-I Walsh on your participant list um, she should kind of I think sort towards the top um, if you can click on her video and on her, there should be a setting there that says pin and um, pin video. And that will be the, the video you wanna be able to see while we're on our session today. Um, if you go to the speaker view, um, you're gonna hear, there's gonna be a couple presenters today. And so we really want you to be able to see Katie Walsh's um, screen because she's the one that's going to be walking around uh, the unit today. So Katie, K-A-D-I, Walsh, W-A-L-S-H, and if you click on her picture, it should, one of the options should come up that says pin video, and make sure you click on pin video, and so you'll be able to see her screen uh, throughout the, the day today, okay? So just a little bit of housekeeping. Hopefully you can do that uh, quickly. And um, I'm gonna get on with the show here so we can utilize our time in the facility. So um, I'm really grateful that uh, Katie Walsh, Katie is a program manager with the, the uh, swine unit in Arlington. And so she's gonna walk around the facility for us. And then we also have uh, Dr. Tommy Crenshaw, who is a uh, swine nutritionist with UW-Madison Animal Sciences. And he's actually the facility supervisor, manager, kind of the, the person that kind of runs the ship. So um, there will be some times that they'll be both uh, communicating while Katie's walking to another part of the facility. Uh, we're, gonna be, uh, we're gonna be hearing from Tommy during that time. 
okay? Um, I'm just gonna really, before we move into Katie, here's a picture of what we're gonna be walking through today. Um, pretty soon, I think we'll, we'll see lovely crops growing and all that as we can see in the picture, um, but uh, pretty soon uh, we'll hopefully get to see some of this uh, green grass growing. So uh, continue, um, I'm gonna pass this on to Katie and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll look to see her pop up um in uh, i'll just pass this over to her and she can take it with her screen i think right now i'm just trying to find her and pin her on mine and there she is so katie's got her head earbuds in her hair in a nice braid and the pink shirt if you if you don't see her all right take it away katie thanks for for being able to do this for us today all right thank you bernie um and thank you for organizing this um this is by far the largest tour we've ever given um, of the swine unit uh, typically, if you were to come in here for an in-person tour, you would have to shower in, um, which I'll show you our locker rooms a little bit later. So we're really glad that you could all join us um, here on this virtual tour. Uh, like Bernie said, my name is Katie. I'm the assistant manager here at the Swine Unit. Um, so I'm going to take you through, it's going to be a brief overview kind of of everything. We want to make sure that we get everything in, um, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. So if at any point you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, otherwise, if there's other topics you would like to have us discuss further, um, feel free to reach out to Bernie um, and we can get a hold of you or you can get a hold of us um, at a later time to go over that stuff. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys um, this map we have um, of the unit. So we're gonna start off, um, we have about a 1500 animal capacity here at the barn. Um, so if you kind of see, we call them our different wings. So there's um, like up here is a wing and our farrowing wing and nursery and finishing. So we're gonna go to each of those wings today. Um, we're only gonna go to one room in each one. So I just want you to kind of see that even though we're only gonna see like one farrowing room, um, there's four others. Um, so it is quite large um, in order to fit those 1,500 animals. Um, we'll start off by going to gestation. So that's going to be uh, this part of the barn up here. Um, we do have about 150 breeding sows um, in that part of the barn. Um, and our sows, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, pig terminology, uh, those are just our adult female pigs um, that we get our baby pigs from. Um, before we go ahead and start out seeing some pigs out there, um, just a few things I want to talk about in here. Um, like I said, I will head to the locker room really quick. Um, so biosecurity is really important in a pig facility. Um, most of your large production farms uh, have pretty strict biosecurity protocols in place. Um, so here's one of our locker rooms. So if you were to come into our tour or into our unit for a tour, um, you would start by walking into this section. Uh, we call this the dirty side. So your clothes, all of your personal belongings stay on this side, nothing comes into the unit. Um, and then we have our showers. And over here we have all of the clothing um, and all sorts of different sizes so that anything that you wear within the unit can stay here. Um, and we also provide boots to wear. Um, it's really important. We don't want to be tracking in um, any manure or anything from the outside um, because it's really easy for the pigs to get sick. And um, so we want to just make sure that we're keeping them healthy. We don't want to be carrying anything in um, on ourselves. Uh, we also have, this is what we call a pass through. Um, so if you do have to bring in like lunch or anything, you can put it in this box. Um, and then after you shower through, you come back and get it. Uh, we have a couple different things for sanitation. Um, like I said, we just want to make sure everything that we're bringing into the barn um, is clean so that the pigs <coughs> can stay healthy. Um, you will notice we do have a kitchen in the unit because we shower in and shower out. Um, we don't get to leave for lunch. Um, so we just bring in our own things here and we can um, cook up some food uh, so that we don't have to leave the unit until we're done for the day. Um, so now we will go ahead um, and we'll start heading towards looking at some pigs. Um, I will stop here just to kind of mention 
Um, a lot of people kind of wonder why we raise pigs inside um, instead of having them outside. A uh, big reason, like I said, with the biosecurity, so we can enforce all of those protocols to keep our pigs happy and healthy. Um, but also because we can set up different uh, like temperature controls. So this screen here, there's a couple different uh, screens we can go to, but from this one control center in the barn, um, we can look at the temperature of every single room in this facility. Um, and we know it will alarm us, it'll text us, it'll email us if it's too hot or too cold. Um, so we're able to maintain a comfortable level for all of our pigs, no matter what the weather is like outside, um, to make sure that you know they're not too hot or too cold during the summer or the winter. So I'm going to start heading to gestation. Um, I believe Dr. Crenshaw um, will go ahead and start talking about some of the history of the unit. Good, I think uh, if I'm coming through okay, uh, Katie, while you're walking down, uh, first, I'd just like to say welcome, and I agree with Katie. This is the largest group that we've ever had on a tour of the Swine Research Unit. Oftentimes, I would take my classes uh, from campus, the college students up to the unit, and they would shire in to work directly with the pigs. Uh, sometimes we have students from the vet school that would come in and work with the pigs, but this building has been in existence since about 1998, uh, but the building was kind of a rebuild of a building that we built in the early 80s. So December 20th of 1995, the first building that we built in the early 80s was actually destroyed by fire. So we're very unfortunate uh, to go through that we got the building rebuilt uh, back and got pigs into the unit. So I'll let Katie take, take back over and talk to you about some of the pigs that she's showing you right now. All right, so this is our gestation barn. Um, like I said, this is where we keep our adult pigs. Um, as we get up here a little bit closer, you'll see where our sows are. Um, so we keep our sows in these gestation stalls. Uh, one of the main benefits of these stalls is the individual assessment um, that we can perform. Uh, or basically, you know, every day when we come in, we get to see each individual sow. Um, we can check right away in the morning. They should all be up. They should all be up and eating um, when we get in. Our feed is set up on a um, automated system, and so every morning at 7 a.m., whether someone is in this barn or not, um, the feed will drop. So when we come in, if a sow is laying down, she's got a pile of feed in front of her. We know that something's probably wrong, so we can immediately attend to her. Um, and make sure she doesn't need any treatments or anything because um, we want to make sure that she's healthy and eating. Because um, each one of these sows that you see um, in these stalls all have little baby pigs growing inside of them right now. Um, they're at different stages, but each one of them um, within a couple months should be farrowing or having um, a bunch of little baby pigs. So we want to make sure that they're really um, healthy and feeling good. Uh, another benefit to the stalls is that we can uh, control their individual feed amounts. Um, and so that kind of helps to make sure that they're not too skinny or too fat. Um, so then the feed is in here and at 7 a.m. it'll drop down through this tube um, into the trough for that individual pig. Um, if any of you know what the gestation length or how long a pig is pregnant for, why don't you go ahead and throw that information in the chat. Um, and we'll see how many of you know how long a, a sow is pregnant for. Yeah. So go ahead and put it in the chat box. How many? How long do you think a, a sow or a gilt is pregnant? So throw some some times in there. Let's get some participation. Okay. So three months, three weeks, three days. That sounds pretty pretty good, right? Um, 114 days. Um, Three days, that would, yeah, that would be, they would probably like that for sure. Um, but yeah, of all the domesticated animals, uh, pigs is really the, the shortest amount of time. Um, yeah. All right, so next thing I want you guys to see um, is our boar bot. So we use this when we're breeding our sows. Um, we do artificial insemination. Um, so we do have a bunch of boars that we collect the semen from in order to breed our sows. 
Um, we are a closed herd, so all of our replacement stock comes from, uh, they're born within the unit. Um, and so Jen here is gonna kind of show you how we use the boar box. Um, if you can see, there's a pig in here, this guy. So we're trying to get him to have nose to nose contact with these gilts. Um, which is just a young female pig um, in order to check if they're in heat so that they're ready to be bred. Um, so I don't know if any of you have ever seen a pig get to ride in a little cart like this, but it's kind of neat. It's pretty convenient for us. And I think the, the boars really seem to enjoy it too. All right, so as we head out, um, yes, the gestation length of a pig is 114 days. So when they're ready to give birth to their pigs, um, or farrow as we call it, uh, we move them into the farrowing room, um, which we will head to next. But first we're gonna take a little stop so that you guys can meet the biggest pig that we have here at the facility. Um, this is Tank. Uh, shout out if Mason is on here watching. Um, Mason is actually the one who named Tank. He is about, three he'll be four this year this november he's going to be four um so how much do you guys think tank weighs does anyone want to take any guesses go ahead and throw it in the chat box guys she's giving you a visual what do you think we've got 700 300 800 1500 we got a, a couple of thousands all right so tank here weighs about a, or 830 pounds um so he's our biggest uh 830 pounds that's pretty big for a boar um so now you guys can say that you saw a pig that weighed over 800 pounds um he's super friendly too we like to give him scratches he loves that stuff all right, so um, we're moving to our farrowing rooms now. Um, this is where the pigs come in, uh, like I said, to give birth to their baby piglets. So we have four rooms that will look very similar uh, to the one we're about to go into. So here we have one of our mini pigs. Um, oh, I guess I forgot to mention, um, here at the facility, we do both agricultural and biomedical research. Um, so a lot of our agricultural research um, is either with reproduction or nutrition, um, different things that the industry um, needs research done on. And we also have biomedical research, um, which basically is the use of the pigs in order to learn more about human diseases. Um, so there's different diseases out there that, uh, or sicknesses that any one of us can get. And so we're able to um, sometimes use the pigs in order to learn more about those. Um, but we also have some conventional pigs and lots of little baby piglets in here. So these piglets are about two and a half weeks old. Um, they're pretty small when they're born. They're only about two pounds when they're born. Um, so when they're in here for about three weeks before they are weaned. Um, so while they're in here, you can probably imagine these little tiny baby pigs like it really warm. Um, but the sows, because they're big and they have a lot more body heat, they like it a lot cooler in this room. So you'll notice over each crate, uh, we have these heat lamps. Um, and you can see this pig's kind of basking in all the warmth there. So we do that and try to try and create two different environments that are gonna make both the sows and the baby pigs happy. Um, so they can come up here to stay warm. She's nice and cool. This room's not too warm. It's about 65 to 70 degrees. She's comfortable. It's a lot warmer um, underneath that heat lamp. So the baby pigs are happy too. Um, I don't know uh, if any of you, probably those of you who um, have either raised pigs or do show pigs have seen our farrowing, have seen a farrowing crate. Um, so the huge benefit to the farrowing crates is the sows have a tendency to lay on their baby pigs. Um, and so this provides some, them some, the baby pigs some protection. Uh, you can see there's these different bars here um, that the sow is laying up against. 
So the piglets are still able to go and nurse on the sow um, to eat, but then if she goes to lay down, you know, she's about five to 600 pounds. Um, and so when she goes to lay down, the little baby pigs can scramble around um, and protect themselves from getting laid on. Um, so if you'll notice also with our baby pigs, you can see uh, this baby pig has some ear notches in its ears. Um, that's the form of identification that we use. Um, so when the pigs are about one to three days old, we process them. Um, and so what we do when we process them is the first thing, um, we use these tools here. Uh, this is our ear notcher. So that's what we use in order to identify the pigs. Each pig has its own unique um, identification number that we notch into their ear so that if they're sick or need to be sorted out, we always know exactly which pig it is. So the, one of the things we do is we ear notch. We also give a shot of iron. Um, so baby pigs don't have enough iron um, in their body to keep them strong and healthy. So we give them an injectable uh, form of iron. And so that's another thing we do when we process, but we wanna make sure that they get that iron um, within about 10 days of being born. And then the third thing we do is we clip their needle teeth. Um, they have eight needle teeth in their mouth, two sets on the top and two on the bottom. Uh, we wanna make sure to get those clipped because um, it can, they, when they fight in their pens or when they're playing, um, they can scratch up each other's faces with those sharp teeth. And also when they're nursing on the sow, um, they can also scratch up on her underline. And so we wanna make sure to protect both the baby pigs and the sows um, from getting scratched up and cut. So we go ahead and clip those really sharp teeth in their mouth. Uh, we also dock their tails with these clippers as well. Um, pigs are very curious. They get bored pretty easily and they like to chew on things. Um, and so we don't want them as they get older to chew on each other's tail. So we go ahead, you can see this guy, he's just got a little bit of a tail left. Um, that way there's not so much for the pigs to chew on um, if they're bored or, you know, um, just decide that they wanna chew on each other's tail. Um, and then the last thing that we do is we castrate our male pig, except for the boars that we want to save um, for a replacement. Um, all right, I think we'll go ahead, like I said, they'll be in farrowing for about three weeks, and then we wean our baby pigs, um, and so we put them into our nursery room, uh, which is where I will head to next. Um, Tom, if you want to come on and talk about some stuff while I'm walking down the nursery, that would be great. All right, great. Well, um, um, Katie's moving down to the next room. Uh, just asked, uh, what have you noticed about the pens in the animal space? Did you see any bedding? You know, animals are kind of like humans. If they eat, um, they have to go to the bathroom. Uh, so there's manure that comes out. So how do we deal with that in a facility like this? Uh, some of the different rooms. And we actually have uh, what's called a flush tank. So we have a large tank that would flush water underneath the areas and take the manure outside of the building. Um, maybe many of you have been camping and you have a pit toilet at a campground. Those pit toilets have a lot of smell and a lot of odor to them. But by using the flush tank, we actually get both you know, the manure out of the building, but it also helps keep the smell. So one thing that you do not see on a video tour like this or you do not experience is the lack of odor that's in the building. So it's different when uh, we're able to get the manure out of the building. Building, not only does it smell better, but it also keeps the animals healthier uh, in this type of a building. And we don't have to use a lot of bedding. All right, Katie's got a, a nice shot of some nursery pigs here. This is my favorite age of the pigs. Yes, like Dr. Kensaw said, um, these are our nursery pigs. Um, they stay in this room for about a month before they move into our finishing room. Um, before I talk about the pig, 
I'm going to take you back here. Um, when Dr. Kensal, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me very well or not. Um, when Dr. Kensal was talking about the flood tank um, that washed out the manure from the pit, this is an example of what a flush tank would look like. So we just have these sitting in the room um, to keep them clean underneath the floor. So by using, right. by using that system, uh, the pigs stay very dry and very clean and they actually prefer that. Uh, but if they're housed in a building where they're not comfortable, usually the, the pens will be wet and messy and there'll be a lot more odor involved with it. So this system allows us to keep the pigs you know, dry and clean and healthy. There was a question about what if um, that system gets clogged? Have you had any issues or how do you fix them? Um, um, or how, you know, what have you come across with, with this type of system? Uh, very unusual. Now it does, you know, occasionally we'll build up, you know, it gets into technical details of how it flushes, but uh, it's fairly low maintenance compared to other systems. Uh, and so we know how to repair that. There's a little air hole that's in there. If that gets plugged up, then it just leaks water out rather than flushes. Uh, so it might be very similar to a toilet that you would have in the house, but it, it flushes a large volume of water really fast. So it minimizes the amount of water, but uh, there's no real moving parts or mechanical equipment that breaks down. So it's really a low maintenance type of, of a, uh, equipment to maintain. Okay, so a little bit about our nursery rooms. Um, as you can tell, the pens aren't very large, just big enough to hold about three or four pigs. Um, the purpose of this is more for research. Um, Dr. Penshaw likes to do a lot of nutrition research um, in the nurseries. Like he said, it's his favorite age. I don't know if that's a coincidence or if that's why he likes to do so many nutrition research projects in here. Um, but it's nice because if we have several different treatments or different diets that we need to put the pigs on, um, you know, then there's just smaller amounts of pigs on each diet. Um, when we do research in here, we use a cart that looks like this. Um, it has this scale on it that we can just put the baby pig right here or the nursery pig um, in this cart and then it'll go ahead and give us how much the pig weighs. Um, so we use that for uh, data when we're doing different research projects. Um, we also have a scale that will weigh their feeders, um, so we know how much feed the nursery pigs are eating. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, finishing area um, where we move the pigs into once they're coming out of nursery after about a month. Brittany, are there any questions so far um, that you need me to cover? Well, there was um, just one question. Well, there were, I'm ask, answering the one about how to mark pigs. And, you know, usually uh, marking pigs occurs by, um, you know, we, we check and write down their ear notches, um, as Katie kind of showed with those little notches in their ears. Um, because uh, keeping ear tags and those types of things in pigs are, are somewhat problematic. And then um, also there is uh, what is called marking chalk. So it's just like a crayon, like you would use in coloring, um, but you actually just, you can make all sorts of, you know, like a hash mark or actually write numbers on the animals. Oh, perfect, good timing. It looks just like that. And you can buy as many different colors as the rainbow for the most part. Um, but that's one that is pretty neat to, to be able to kind of visually kind of identify animals when needed. Anything else to add to that one? Nope, um, I think that was good. Yep, you can see here, we also like to use uh, spray paint as well, or I mean, it's not, um, it's an animal spray paint, but um, so we have different colors of that as well as the marking sticks, um, like Bernie said. Um, so this room right here is our scale area slash loadout. Um, so any pigs that leave the facility, will leave through that door there. Um, as you can see, we kind of have like an interesting here um, as a circle. 
Um, so we use what we know about animal movement and animal behavior um, in order to try to adjust the gait so that it's uh, the least stressful um, on the pigs getting onto the trailer as well as um, the minimal amount of labor that we need. Um, so I can load, you know, have 30 pigs in this loadout area and I can load them out onto the trailer by myself. Um, and we're talking like 250 pound pigs. Um, so not the little small ones that you've just been looking at, um, but good market sized pigs. Um, so it's fairly easy to get them out with the, the system that we have set up. Um, so this scale area um, is where we would weigh pigs, um, especially for research, uh, when we need to do like weekly weights. Um, so the pigs come in through this door and then they just funnel right through here. They get onto the scale. Um, we get their weights. If we need to put an ear tag in or mark them, do anything like that, we can do that while they're um, in the scale area. And then they go out that side um, and there's actually a little holding area that I'll go to. Okay, uh, so Katie, while you're going, I have a question for you. So yes. in the um, um, finishing rooms, we have a lot of times about 80 pigs in a room. So if you were working to weigh the pigs, how long would it take you and maybe one or two assistants that would be running the pigs while you were weighing the pigs, how long would it take you to weigh 80 pigs? Um, well, the first week, the first time that we do it, it takes a little bit longer. Um, depending on the size of the pigs, um, I would say we typically can weigh 80, um, maybe in like, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, it's been a while since we've weighed whole rooms, um, but that first time takes a little longer. But once they've gone through this scale here, um, you know, one or two times, they pick up on it really quickly. Um, pigs are incredibly intelligent, um, so it doesn't take long for them to understand how this works. Um, and so we can kick through those rooms a lot faster, you know, weighing 80 pigs, um, you know, by the third or fourth week. Um, depending on how many people you have helping to bring pigs into the room, um, it would take probably about half the time as it does that first time um, to weigh them. So they do pick up on it pretty quickly. Um, and it's a, you know, an easy two person job. Um, you know, one person is just bringing the pigs to the scale area, another person's in here weighing and write down, writing down weights, and then the other person brings them back to their pens. Um, it works pretty smooth with the way this system is set up in the doors. Right, and, and so if you look at that and you think about, if, if, especially if some of you have pigs at home, uh, and if you look, you see open areas where you know the pig can see through those, and you also see solid partitions, and that helps control where the pig goes. So if you're designing and building buildings, you wanna make sure to think about how does the pig respond and what you can do with the design of the building for solid and open space to help with the pig movement. What's the red thing that you see over against the wall there? So these red things right here, those are the boards that we use, um, a sorting board in order to help move the pigs um, down the hall. Also, if we have to sort pigs out of the pen, um, it helps us to do that. There's also this orange thing here that's a paddle. Um, that's also helpful in sorting pigs. Um, you can kind of just lightly tap on the pig um, to get it to move. You can use a combination of the board and the paddle um, in order to sort that pig out. Um, and so it's also pretty minimal effort when you've got those great tools to help you um, sort your pigs out. It's a lot less stressful on both the, the worker and the pigs. Um, they, they work pretty well with those boards and the paddles. Yeah, so, so the paddle is actually more like a baby rattle. It has a, 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 it's plastic and it has a rattler in it. So the pig with a little bit of noise, uh, it actually helps you control where the pig goes. And then the sorting board is solid. So the pig, if it's down close to the floor, the pig uh, you know, wants to move towards the open area. So that helps the pig move away from or move in the direction that you want to all right so this is our one of our finishing rooms um, again you're only going to see one but we have five down this hall um, so this is where pigs go after they move out of nursery and they will stay here um, until they're ready to go to market so about 250 pounds 
Um, they'll be about six months old and they will be ready to leave the barn. Um, so again, the pen size, uh, we have small pen sizes compared to what you would see in a large production facility. Um, a large production facility would have all 80 of these pigs in one pen, um, but because of research projects, um, we have smaller pen sizes so that we can keep, um, you know, only five to a pen. Again, with the different diets, um, you can have a lot more pigs on different diets um, in these small sizes. Um, it's kind of hard to see, um, but if you can see back there, the floor is flatted. Um, but actually the front of their pen is solid concrete, uh, like the hallway. There we go, they kind of move for you. Um, so we do have three rooms that are set up with that type of flooring. And then we also have two rooms that are fully slatted. Um, so you wouldn't have any of this solid uh, flooring, it's all slatted. Um, and these guys are a little bit loud. So Dr. Crenshaw, if you wouldn't mind just discussing um, why we have the two different types of flooring um, in the unit. Okay, so you know, one reason the unit was designed as a research building and, and I do a lot of nutrition research. And so being able to measure with different diets, sometimes the pigs like the diets that we, we put together and sometimes they might not like them as much. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're accurately measuring the food consumption. And if this, the floor is fully slatted, the feed, if they try to waste it, would drop down into the pit and we would not know whether their pigs are eating, it, eating the feed or not. So we designed the, the solid floors so we could know and observe if there's any feed wasted. Uh, in the commercial industry, most of the floors would be fully slatted and they would be feeding a more standard diet. So sometimes in our research uh, facilities, we need that solid floor to help with the research. And what Katie's just pointed to with that feeder, if she can go back, we actually weigh the feed. That's an electronic scale. We have an overhead rail and we crank up with the uh, crank so we don't have to pick the feed up. We can actually weigh the feeder. So before uh, the pigs consume that, we can lift the feed up, get a weight on it, after maybe a week, we'll weigh the feed back and we know how much feed disappeared over that week or how much feed they consumed. That helps us make decisions about whether or not we have the right ingredients, the right nutrients in the diets that we're feeding to our pigs. If we feed them junk food, they don't grow as good. If we feed good food and it's a good balanced diet, then we can get our pigs to grow very well within the, within the unit. Pigs are kind of curious and they're coming up and they're really nosing around again. If you look at the pens and the space, uh, this environment is clean. Even on the solid floor, if the ventilation is correct, the environment, the pigs prefer to stay dry and clean. So if the ventilation is correct, they can stay dry and clean. If it's not, they might be irritated. It'd be kind of like sitting under a draft and they're uncomfortable. So they will defecate or urinate in the wrong spots and the, the pens will stay messy. So keeping a dry, clean pig is, is what we like to do. And we work a lot on the ventilation and how the building was designed, uh, you know, to take the ventilation into account and how we control air movement in the room makes a lot of a difference. Hey um, guys, do you want to answer a question as to how you decide which pigs go in what pens? Okay, I can try that if Katie's still in, got some noise in the background. Uh, a lot of times on experiments, we might randomly allot the pigs into the pen so they're even. So we know if we have different diets in different pens, we know whether or not the difference is because of the diet that we're feeding. But if it was a typical production unit, the litter mates might stay together from the farin room into the nursery room, into the finishing rooms, so they might, you know, if you mix pigs, and if any of you work with pigs, if you mix two pigs that have not been together before, they have a social dominance pattern and they will fight with each other to establish who's the toughest kid on the block. And so the pigs like to establish that. And when they're little, it's kind of fun to watch the little pigs fight with each other to establish that. But as they get bigger, they can do a lot of damage to each other. 
So you don't like to mix pigs if they've not been penned together. So that mixing occurs uh, very carefully, and usually it's earlier in the life of the pig. Uh, Katie's now m moving down the hallway, um, and she's going into one of the labs. She's got her phone muted still, and I can let her explain nope. if you want to see what you're seeing in the lab. Yep, I'm good now. Okay. Okay, so um, this is our lab. Um, we pretty much keep all of our supplies um, in here for treatments, medications, anything like that. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, um, we do all of our own uh, semen collection for breeding. Um, so we come in here, we've got some scales set out um, in order to properly extend the semen. Um, we do that so that um, we can get more doses, so we can breed more sows um, out of the one collection, as well as the extender um, helps the, so, um, so the sperm survive longer um, than it would if it was not extended. Typically, it lasts about five to seven days um, after collection. So we use the microscope um, in order to make sure that the sperm is alive and moving well. Um, and then it would just go into, once we know that it's good, um, it just goes into one of these bottles. We have different color caps that we use so we know um, what breed of pig it was. Um, so here at the facility, majority of our female pigs are a cross between a large white and a land race. Um, but we do also have some large white and land race purebreds as well as Duroc purebreds. Um, we like to use the Duroc to cross with the large white and the land race um, for our market pigs. Um, they grow really well and they make a really nice market pig with those genetic crosses. There was um, a question. Have, oh, can I ask this question? Um, it's one about the semen. So do we, in a closed herd, do you guys bring semen in from outside or do you uh, collect uh, semen within uh, the facility? So either Katie or, or Tommy, how do you want to handle answer that one? Um, we do not bring in any semen. Um, currently, we collect all of it here that we use from the unit. Um, the only, if we are looking to um, bring in new genetics to the facility, um, we actually do a C-section. Um, and Tom, I haven't, they haven't done it since I've been here. Um, but Tom, if you just want to mention real quick um, kind of the process with that and how it got set up. Um, as I get out some stuff to go over treatments. Sure, there's, there are certain diseases that are unique to pigs and the best way to maintain the health status is to not allow, allow those pigs to have contact with their pigs. And even with the semen that might be collected from a, uh, the male pig, you can bring some of those diseases in that way. So. The health status of the pig and the reason we shower into the unit and go to all that trouble is to maintain the, you know, the healthy pigs. And if we brought semen or other pigs in from the outside and mixed with those pigs, we would likely bring a disease in with that. So with all the research that we do in the unit, uh, the health status is, is very critical to us. Um, and so you know, what you might do in a commercial operation is you know, bring semen from a boar stud or something like that into the unit, but there's a chance if we did that, that we would bring a disease in as well. And we have a lot of investment in the genetics and some of the biomedical animals that we really cannot afford to take that risk. And so we've established a breeding system that would allow us to maintain the genetic differences that we need without needing to bring semen in from the outside. All right, thank you. Um, so if you guys can see over here, um, we have this nice setup for different size syringes and needles. Uh, for those of you 4-H um, and FFA kids, anyone that shows um, animals, you should know, right? We wanna make sure we're paying attention to our different size needles um, for the size of animal that we're using them on. Uh, like these 20 gauge needles, uh, they're only a half inch long, they're not very big. Um, those are the type of needles we would use on our baby pigs. And then we've got some 16 gauge needles um, that are inch and a half long. Um, so like that would be a good example that we would use on an adult pig um, that's a lot bigger, it's got tougher skin. 
Um, so we make sure that we clearly label all of our needles and that we're double checking before we use them um, to make sure that it's the proper size for the animal that we're giving an injection to. Um, along with that, uh, I know a lot of you kids probably also know how important it is to keep good records. Um, they're not just telling you to do that for your individual projects. It's really important um, in production and at a research facility as well. This is an example of one of our treatment sheets. Um, you can see down here, you know, we've got the withdrawal. We want to make sure that um, our pigs are past their withdrawal date if they received a medication before sending them um, to market. We keep track of their ID, their location, weight, different things like that. Um, we can talk about what might be um, going on with the pig, you know, if they're off feed, whatever. Um, we just like to keep really good records so that we know what's going on. Um, and if something's wrong with our pig, anybody who comes in to work here, um, whether it's on the weekend or if everybody's not in on the same day, um, everybody kind of knows what's going on with that pig so that it can be properly taken care of um, and back on its feet feeling good in no time. Um, so for now, we will move on to our surgery suite. Um, my coworker, Jen, is going to walk you through um, our surgery and kind of talk about the different projects um, that we do for surgery. Um, I'm gonna step through this room quick, it echoes. A lot of organizing for our specific projects um, that deal with surgery um, in the biomedical research. So I will let her go ahead and talk about our surgery. This year in our prep room, we have the capabilities of doing um, a large 600 pound sow all the way to a two kilogram, two day old piglet. Um, we do a wide variety of surgeries. Um, we usually use to the animals surgery, so we'll put um, a captive older um, animal um, all the way down to a piglet so you can see the difference um, in the equipment that we need to keep here. Um, we'll normally shave the area to have surgery and then prep it with um, some alcohol and betadine solutions. And then once the animal is prepared for surgery, we'll move them into the surgical suite. Um, we do a wide range of surgeries. Um, cardiothoracic surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, um, embryo transfers. So depending on the surgery, um, the room could be set up different. This um, table is designed for a smaller animal. If you were doing a large um, sow or uh, gilt for an embryo transfer, we actually um, sedate them on this table and roll it on in. We have a lift that lifts them up. Um, so we're not breaking our backs. <laughs> um, we have full capabilities of Ventilation, um, we have a complete monitor that does invasive blood pressure, capnography. Um, it'll take your pulse and respiratory rate as well as your oxygenation of your blood. Um, we do have this set up if you'd like to see just how the ventilator works. This part right here would actually simulate an animal's lungs so you can see how it's putting pressure. It forces the air into the lungs. Um, this is necessary on any surgery that opens the cardiothoracic cavity, but we um, use it standardly on most all of our surgeries to support the animals a little better and provide um, better oxygenation for them. Um, we also have a fluid pump. We usually support the animals uh, during the course of a surgery with a fluid rate. Um, we have the capabilities of doing cautery, um, just some surgical instruments. Um, once we complete surgery in here, the animals will actually um, will allow them to start to wake up on their own and then we'll move them into our recovery suite, which is right next door. Um, we have the ability to recover four animals at a time. These can all be cordoned off from each one. We have mats in place on the floor. In the case of small piglets, we actually use a small bed. And then we have a heat source to keep them warm while they recover. Um, you know, recovery can take anywhere from 15 minutes to about two hours. And once they're up and walking, they get returned to their home again. This actually in the corner is the lift for the surgery table. If you want to There's a question that, related. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question about how long can a surgery be? 
Like, um, depending on what you're doing, can you give us kind of a, a range? Um, we actually do surgeries that last um, probably anywhere from an hour to 12 hours, um, depending on the procedure. We have some prolonged um, nerve stimulation procedures that usually go 12 to 13 hours long. Um, we support the animals with temperature and you know fluids. Um, it, it doesn't quite matter the duration of the surgery. The recovery time seems to be the same. Um, what you, you know, decrease that anesthesia and allow them to wake up on their own, they usually all recover kind of at the same time. Any other questions? Yeah. Katie, you're cutting out quite a bit in, in the recovery. You might move back into the surgeon room to so, answer questions. Yes, are there any other questions? Does anybody have any other questions, Bernie, um, that either myself or Jen can answer? Yeah, so the, I mean, one question was, um, are the surgeries uh, for helping humans? Or, um, you know, what would the surgeries, what would be some procedures that you would maybe most likely be doing uh, using the surgery suite for? Um, so one of the surgeries, we are trying to create a, a cardiothoracic model that um, mimics um, congenital heart disease in pediatric patients. So we did surgery on about two week old piglets and they actually banded the pulmonary arteries, um, which um, simulates how it normally occurs in a human baby. And then we grew them out to see at what stage it was best to um, fix the problem. So um, delaying anesthesia and developing brains is a positive thing. So we are trying to um, delay doing the surgery, see how long, monitor these animals, how long we could keep them at a stable rate um, before we could actually fix the um, defect. Um, we also do embryo transfers. So we are trying to create um, models to mimic different human diseases. So a lot of these embryos that we implant are gene edited, and then we will raise those pigs um, for a specific um, disease occurrence, whether it be you know, a subtype of cancer, um, a, neurodevelopment issue, um, different uh, cardiovascular diseases. So um, we have a whole department that we work with on campus that does all the gene editing for us. And in addition to that, we have had some um, people take advantage of our surgery suite to also do research um, for the pig industry as well. Um, so on an agricultural side, as well as biomedical, um, our surgery suite is available for both types of research. Um, one question was, how, how are the pigs transported into the kind of recovery area? I think uh, they may have missed that. Just Can you just go over that real quick? Yep, so um, once they start recovering um, on the surgical table, um, depending on the size of the pig, we'll either hand carry them or um, our larger surgery table that's located in this room, we actually just roll them in and transfer um, them in that way. Um, so we can keep them under heat support until they're able to get up on their own. All the tables are mobile, so they have wheels on them. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, um, I'm just kind of, there's kind of a few coming through here, so I'm trying to sort them and kind of group them, but um, Maybe I was trying to get the surgery ones while we were here. Um, uh, so what helps takes the tickle from this farm too? Um, so maybe just talk a little bit. I think you talked to quite a bit about like the, the research um, and utilizing like and using uh, pigs as a model for humans. Do you want to uh -huh. expand a little bit on that? Because I think that's where some of the questions are, are surrounding. Okay, so um, pigs are kind of um, an ideal source to use for research, especially if we're trying to compare it to the human body. Their anatomy and size is very similar to ours, um, especially the mini pig model that we have developed. Um, their average adult weight is about 200 pounds. So um, a lot of researchers like to use them um, for different procedures. And then we can also um, do imaging on them, such as uh, CT scans, MRIs, um, uh, they do ultrasound procedures. We have a big project going on right now that they're trying to develop um, a new method to break up tumors within the body that's completely non-invasive. 
So they're using our pigs for that. Um, it's a specific liver model and the pig liver is very similar to the human liver. So they have been using it to um, test on the pigs to make sure it's not causing any underlying issues such as hitting organs they don't want to or causing any thrombi, um, clots in the blood vessels or um, any adverse effects. It's been very successful so far. So it's looking yeah. for to get FDA approval at this point. So hopefully actually I'll be on the market soon. So uh, Bernie, uh, uh, somebody has their hand raised there. Gene Patton, I don't know if you've seen that. Nope, I didn't yet. I was typing into a question here. So um, hang tight, um, I can, sure. I'm, Go ahead yep. with uh, what your plan on the tour and I can hit that, yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll do one other quick example and some of you might know, you know, another type of surgery that we've done is on little baby pigs and this was related to humans. Uh, sometimes uh, little babies are born and their foot is deformed and it's called a club foot. And so we've actually worked with some of the orthopedic surgeons and being able to do some things with bone where they can go in and straighten up the bones and, sh and show some procedures in the light little baby pig that would allow them to straighten up the bones much faster. So that's a, a fairly quick uh, surgical procedure and the little baby pig is helping us to solve the problem for the human infant. There's a couple of questions about COVID. If uh, pigs can get the coronavirus or COVID virus, I, I think there was a research study done here by Germany um, related to that. Does anybody want to talk about that in general? Yeah. I um, at this time, um, I haven't heard that we have had any um, cases of COVID in pigs. I know that they have been doing a lot of uh, research with some of the primates but um, I don't know that they've used a pig model to infect them yet to see how it's transmitted. Yeah, there's no, there's no evidence that, that pigs would get that. There is that cats and tigers have gotten the, the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus, but there's no evidence yet that uh, pigs would get it. And as many you know, cases as we've had around the world with that, I think that would have shown up you know, with the human and animal contact. So, doesn't look like pigs have a problem with the, the COVID-19 virus that we're dealing with for people. There's other, um, other diseases and other viruses that pigs can get, but not the one that we're dealing with in our isolation steps right now. Mm -hmm. um, can both of you guys like um, uh, talk about your backgrounds related to um, your your schooling, your majors, you know, what's your focus and in, in how you kind of got to where you are right now? There's a question kind of around careers. Um, yeah, I actually um, went to school originally as an animal science um, zoology major. And then um, I also got my CBT and I worked in um, uh, contract research for about five years before um, starting at the university. Um, and I've worked as a veterinary technician and research technician here at the university for um, about 14 years. And um, I primarily did primates for most of that time and then recently transitioned into pigs. Um, a lot of researchers use uh, multiple species. So I'm still working with some of the same researchers that I did with the primates but now they're transitioning into doing um, pig research also. Um, and I went to UW Platteville for animal science and ag business. Um, prior to going to college, I had never worked with pigs before, um, but when I went to UW Platteville, I had the opportunity to work at both the beef center and the swine center um, there at the Pioneer Farm. Um, so that's kind of where I got my first exposure to pigs. Um, when I graduated, um, with a bachelor's of science degree in animal science. Um, I went to Iowa and I actually worked at a pig production facility. Um, there was about 2,800 sows, um, so quite a bit larger than this, um, but that was purely just production purposes. Um, so I was there for a little while before I started working um, for a livestock auction company, um, Equity Livestock. Um, and I was there for about a year and a half working as a commodities broker um, and also doing a lot of work with the markets. Um, and then about a year ago is when I started here. 
Um, so I have a farm, farm background, um, grew up with livestock, uh, decided I liked them enough that I wanted to come back working with pigs. And then Tommy, do you want to talk about your background? How long do we have? Yeah. Uh, well, I, you I know, real, make, make, real it, make it short, yeah. You know, I grew up on a small farm and actually grew up picking cotton. So I grew up in the South and uh, used to pick cotton. We had uh, a few uh, pigs when I was real young, but cattle, but cotton and soybeans was the main crop. And then went off to college in Tennessee was my home. And then went, uh, after four years there, went to Nebraska and spent uh, time learning more about nutrition and pigs there and then moved to Wisconsin. So I've been at Wisconsin ever since uh, uh, throughout my career. So it's been a, a long history and some of your parents or grandparents uh, I may have had in classes. I've been looking at some of the names on the list to see if I recognize some, but I've had uh, that opportunity to teach now at the university and to do research with the pigs. And it's a lot of fun. I like to work with pigs. I don't like to pick cotton. I was, you know, anything but picking cotton. That's a lot of work. So. Okay, I'm just trying to look through some. Um, let's see, how many pigs are there? I guess that was, I don't know if you covered that in the beginning, but um, there was a couple of questions around how many and then the breeds, um, you know, about the pigs with the, um, that were different colored and spotted versus, you know, the white pigs. Yeah, so um, we have about 150 sows um, in our breeding herd, and then um, uh, probably about almost a thousand pigs um, in the stage, anywhere from those little tiny baby pigs to market size, um, so about 250 pounds, six months old. Um, so we're probably at about, um, what would that be, um, 1,250. Uh, pigs here at the unit. Um, and like I said, uh, majority of our sows are a large white and a land race cross. Um, we do have some purebred Duracs. Um, a lot of the boars that we use to breed um, are a Durac um, because we like to cross those for our market pigs. Um, we like the large whites in the land race for their maternal traits um, in our sows, but the Duracs uh, have great traits um, for raising market pigs um, and the meat quality and their growth rate. Um, so that's why we like to cross those um, to take advantage of the genetics from the Dirac um, in order to raise our market pigs. Uh, one person asked, do you name the pigs, Katie? <laughs> um, we do have a couple, like Tank, he's got his name. Um, there's actually a sow out there in gestation. Um, my coworker Carrie named her Rosie. Um, she's a total sweetheart. You can pick her out right away. She likes to be scratched behind her ears. Um, she's super friendly. So yeah, sometimes all of our boars have names. Um, as soon as they're trained and we can start collecting them, they all get their own name and they have a card hung above them with their name. Um, but yeah, every once in a while when we have kind of our favorite pigs, you know, we'll pick a name for them and it usually sticks. Okay, I think, um, let's see, that was kind of most of them. Um, I've been giving some here related to uh, the chat. I think we're kind of caught up. So um, if you want to go ahead and go to the next spot. Um, well, that's actually all I have for you guys. Um, so thank you for joining on. I hope you enjoyed seeing the pigs. Um, if there are any topics that anybody has more um, of an interest in or that we didn't go over, like I said, this was very brief. Um, I probably could have spent an hour in almost any of those wings um, talking about different things. Um, so you got kind of just a, a brief summary um, to go through this tour. So if there's any topics that anybody is interested in learning more about, um, you can reach out, let Bernie know. Um, she can pass along information um, so that we can make sure um, to get any questions answered. 
Um, also, if there are any ag teachers out there, anything, um, anyone looking to do their own uh, personal virtual tour, uh, we're always available and willing to set one of those up. Um, so if anyone wants to see more specific things or have a more personalized tour, we can um, get that set up as well. Yeah, uh, thanks you guys for being willing uh, to be on today. Um, it was a challenge to keep up with all the chatting. So I know I'm gonna, I know I missed uh, some in there, um, but we really enjoyed you ha being here. Thanks Katie and Dr. Crenshaw for being willing to do this for us today. Um, two things for the attendees, there's a um, Qualtrics survey that we really would like you to fill out. And again, like I mentioned in the beginning, it kind of helps us kind of formulate um, some ways on how to, to program with you all. And then I will be sending out an email that follows up with that. Um, I guess there was one cool question here at the end. How many total rooms are in, there in the facility, Katie and Dr. Crenshaw? I mean, that's kind of like, ooh, how many? But that's a really good question here that somebody uh, ended with. Yeah, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna look at the map um, and actually I'll turn that back around. Um, so gestation is all one big room. Um, we have four farrowing rooms and then a separate room there um, that's kind of used more for uh, like intensive research um, or treatment pens. Um, so we have five rooms within the farrowing wing. Um, we have six rooms here in the nursery wing. Um, so that would be where we saw the smaller pens of the smaller pigs. Um, and then we also have five rooms in the finishing wing. Um, so that's kind of it. This other area here, um, we do have some different pens here that we can put. We typically put our mini pigs. Um, so those pigs that you saw that looked different, they were smaller, uh, they were spotted, some were black. Um, they looked different than our, our white pigs. Um, those are our minis that Jen talked about um, that are used a lot for research. Um, so we typically keep them in this room here. We call it the classroom. Um, and then we kind of have our surgery suite and the main office and everything else. Um, so this is a big picture overall. Um, if you want to try and count the individual rooms, go ahead. Um, but typically there's about four, five, or six rooms per wing. Okay, good. Uh, there is one question about what do you guys vaccinate for? So I thought that was a good question. I think that's by one of our ag teachers here in Wisconsin. So Dr. Crenshaw and Katie, do you, one of you guys want to ask that or answer that one? You want me to do that one, Katie? What's that? You, you want me to do that one? Um, yeah, if you want, since you were here um, when we started with the Lasonia. Yeah, so, so the routine vaccination with minimum health, yeah, we vaccinate for uh, lepto and erysipelas and parvovirus. That would be, you know, kind of in a C-section derived herd, kind of the minimum vaccinations that we would do. And up until uh, we broke with actually uh, Lasonia or an Iliadis problem, and that was about three years ago. We now have been vaccinating for uh, Lasonia, which is kind of a uh, diarrheal disease that occurs in some of the finishing pigs. So we try to keep those kind of diseases out, but those would be the only routine vaccinations that we would do within the unit. And so, Bernie, if you've got, I don't know if you've got other questions, but I have a comment I wanted to kind of make, if sure. I could, with all the uh, students that are on here. They were asking about careers. Yeah, I would be curious as to what they would think about as a career and what they've seen. And as you go through the unit and listen to what was described today, there's all kinds of opportunities uh, working with pigs. Uh, for future careers. You could work directly with the animal, uh, you could work in support areas, nutrition, or with breeding companies. Um, you know, those are certainly jobs that would be obvious, but things that might not be quite as obvious, there's a lot of opportunities for engineers. We talked about ventilation and manure management, and those kind of jobs also take a lot of math. So I'm looking at a lot of faces on the screen, and I know all of you are doing, you know, learning at home. I would want to encourage you to make sure you're keeping up with your homework, 
especially math. And if you get science and chemistry classes, those would really help. If you heard you know, Katie and Jennifer talk about some of the things they were doing, you know, it takes you know a lot to learn that, but there's a lot of different kinds of jobs and things that you could do. So study hard, work hard, uh, find things that you're excited about doing. There's a lot of opportunities for you. Okay, well, I think that's great. There are still some questions coming in, but I think we do need to wrap it up for the day. Um, we are a little over our one hour. Um, I did send uh, two things, two links uh, in the chat. If you can copy and paste the link in there for the survey. And then um, there also is a link that I put in there for those that are um, needing educational credits in order to exhibit at the fair. I also put a link in there where there's an educational form you can fill out and then give to your county people, okay? Um, at the end of all of these, I will have a spreadsheet that I'll send to all of the counties um, of the participants, but for right now, um, that is what we can do. So um, thanks again, everyone, um, for coming. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again for, to Katie and Dr. Crenshaw. Um, as of note, uh, we will be having this recording available probably on Monday. It should, should be able to be uh, available. So thanks again, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, thanks Katie. for setting all of this up. Yeah, thanks, Katie, and thanks, Dr. Crenshaw. Have a good day. Thank you.